The one thing in my mind that really separates Belgian ale from other regional styles is their unique fermentation character. Esters and phenols imparted by a certain type of yeast, the degree of which varies between strains. For those who are into more balanced Belgian character, something that won't clash with hops or overwhelm the senses, Imperial Yeast just released B53, a new seasonal strain that promises to produce beers with a clean, bright ester profile. And while it works great on its own, using it in conjunction with W15 Suburban Brett in secondary leads to a beer that's crisp, dry, and deliciously complex. Be sure to grab some B53 Precious right away because it is a seasonal release and will not be around for long. One of the most commonly recommended methods for new brewers looking to improve the quality of their beer is to propagate yeast in a starter, which not only increases cell counts and ensures adequate pitching rates, but wakes the yeast up and readies them for battle. Now, for the good majority of standard OG ale, starter volumes tend to be fairly reasonable, usually a liter or less. However, when making bigger beers or cool fermented lagers that purportedly demand higher cell counts, starter sizes can become rather large. You're listening to the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott, and joining me today to talk about the pretty specific variable of decanting yeast starters is fellow contributor Brian Hall. You know, Marshall, that is a pretty specific variable, and I think it's one that a lot of people don't give a lot of thought to. Um, I know I've been making starters for for years, uh, especially when doing some of the sour beers where you're trying to get cultures raised up from bottles or, or you know, even clean beers from bottles. And I've, I, I have to admit, I haven't really given a lot of thought to just pitching the smaller starters and, you know, with lagers, it's just, uh, just decant and toss. But, you know, this, this experiment you did and just kind of our discussions the last couple of days have got me thinking about, you know, a little more about the effects of, of pitching the entire starter. And I think today we're going to dive into some, some pretty good pros and cons and, and application of doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I got into the yeast starter game pretty quickly, uh, convinced it was this magic bullet to making my homebrew, um, taste, I, well, a little bit less like homebrew, I guess. I think that's why a lot of people end up adopting the practice. Uh, and based on the info that I read online and heard on podcasts, I developed some pretty strong opinions about this very specific variable of decanting starters. Um, you know, I kind of I kind of thought it was pretty important not to toss that stuff into the beer. Uh, we're going to be getting into that as well as some interesting experiment results. That is the purpose of this show. All right, the time is nigh for those who plan on attending this year's BYO Boot Camp in Asheville, North Carolina. Our presentation is submitted. The beers have been brewed, and Denny, Drew, and I will be heading out in just two weeks. Uh, you can still save $25 on registration by using code BYO Bootcamp Brewlosophy when you check out. Uh, we're really looking forward to seeing all the folks attending our sessions. Uh, if you appreciate what we're doing and would like to help us to continue doing it, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash brewlosophy, where for a small monthly pledge, you'll receive rewards like unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invite to a monthly live q a session with somebody cool in the brewing world coming up later this month is stan hieronymus published author and hop expert uh, and we've got a bunch of great other guests lined up as well again that's patreon.com slash brewlosophy head over there to learn more uh, and if you wouldn't mind using the links found at brewlosophy.com slash support when shopping online we'd really appreciate that as well all right, feedback this week is brought to you by Brewers Hardware, who offer professionals and home brewers a vast array of unique and purpose-built products, such as the Quick Clean Take Apart Ball Valve. I've been using those for a while. They're amazing. Uh, and the beautiful BH15 Turnkey Pilot Brewing System. These dudes seriously know what's up and are always open to answering questions so that you can get the gear that's right for you. Check them out at brewershardware.com and make sure to let them know that Brewlosophy sent you so that you receive a free gift. Again, that's brewershardware.com. Uh, listener Patrick Patty Smith uh, wrote in with a comment on malt conditioning, which we discussed in the latest Brew and A episode. He said, you had a question about malt conditioning. Here's my experience. Uh, during one club meeting, I'll never forget, we had a presentation on malt conditioning. I was immediately convinced this would be a part of my brew day or better yet, pre-brew day prep forever and it has. The presenter sprayed a minuscule amount of measured water onto the malt. This calculation is uh, total ounces of malt times 0.02 equals the total ounces of water by weight that you use. Uh, for most six-gallon batches, we're talking about four to seven ounces of water by weight. 
The malt doesn't feel wet at all. The visual difference was astounding. The presenter had typical quart-sized plastic containers like those found in Chinese takeout filled with malt. One container had been conditioned and the other was not. The conditioned malt seemed to take up nearly double the space in the container compared to the unconditioned malt and appeared fluffy. Uh, I was told I was sold instantly. Uh, I'm not sure how much it helps my beers, but just going off the visual aspect of the demo, I can't skip it now. The process is very simple. I spray the malt with the pre-measured water as I measure the grain into buckets before milling. I make sure to mix it well and then uh, let it sit for 10 minutes before milling. Pretty simple. Maybe an experiment could sway us otherwise. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't think there's any question, Brian, that this is an experiment that you should tackle. Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like just listening to that, it sounds like an infomercial for spraying your malt. And there's got to be some product somebody's going to develop soon, yeah, uh, for making for making it easy. But right now, it sounds difficult. Um, I don't really see any application for uh, my brewing process personally. Um, but you know, it's kind of one of those things. Whatever makes you happy. If you're someone that likes to quadruple decoct, more power to you. If you get some love out of it, I'm just, I'm just not that kind of guy. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's cool that, that he uh, gave us this, uh, you know, this, um, I guess method for, for doing this. So thanks for that, Patty. Um, I, I still don't get why it matters. That's, I, I guess that's the part. And I, and I do think it's deserving of an experiment. Maybe we can get somebody, uh, who's a little bit more, um, I, you know, I, I guess anal about, <laughs> about, you know, certain aspects of <laughs> their uh, lager brewing process maybe jake or matt wants to tackle this one but it doesn't seem to make much sense for me using a bag um because yeah. the, the only benefit and i think you and i talked about this brian the real the really the only benefit that i see um to, to malt conditioning is that you keep those husks intact but I, you know yeah. i'm not convinced that doing so has any impact you know i i i've had some i've had some sparge issues on some of the larger batches i've done where i've done weird things that i promised myself I'd never repeat again, like, you know, pump, <laughs> pumpkin beers or beers with copious amounts of wheat and oat in a, in a very, very, very large mash ton. I have had some issues there. So anything to get the malt a little fluffier and a better grain bed. Okay. I could, I, I might be attracted to that, but, um, you know, also another way to do that, get your malt kind of nice as I found is using a three roller mill. Yeah. And that's something that I only have to press click buy it now once, and I don't ever have to deal with it again. So my, my biggest concern in all of this mainly is just is I understand that the the malt doesn't feel wet, but putting any moisture into my mill makes me weary. Yeah, that that's my biggest concern as well. And uh, I've heard I did hear some feedback after after the brew and a episode that in order if you do malt condition and uh, so that that malt's just somewhat wetter than usual, all you have to do is run you know like a quarter pound of dry malt through, and it and apparently dries off the 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 uh, rollers. But I, you know, again, it's not something I've ever tried. I do appreciate the method though, Patty. If you have show feedback, you can send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com. Uh, leave us a voice message by calling 951-444-0320 or drop us a note on social media. Okay. As regular listeners of this show heard last week, at least those who, um, who, who don't skip through this first segment of the show, <laughs> uh, the wives of my friends, Jersey and Tim uh, reviewed an interesting sour wine like beer sent in by listener Jordan folks. Uh, they weren't big fans. And while the feedback I got from other listeners was surprisingly positive. I think they liked hearing uh, a couple ladies' voices on this on the show. Uh, I have to imagine that they understood that the ladies weren't really intending to be mean, but I still felt sort of bad. Well, thankfully, Jordan took it all in stride, had a good laugh. Told, he told me that this beer is generally well-received by his friends uh, up in Portland, uh, the, those that he shared it with. So, eh, well, uh, Amber and Michelle weren't the only ones who reviewed it. One Minute Beer Review with Jersey and Tim. Oh, this is grape juice. Is this the wine review? Ooh, it smells like port. You don't know what port smells like. I do. Um, this is like sour sour grapes. It is sour. Ooh, I like it. It's grape hey, juice. Hey, hey, this is a this is grape juice. Well, dude, we can't like this. Well, too late. And I don't even know that there's any alcohol in it. Let me see. <laughs> like you know, what are you gonna do? It's good. You know, I always know if there's alcohol in something. If you can chug it and it doesn't hurt, there's no alcohol. This will yeah. not hurt. Ice on the count of three. Break left. Three, two, one. There's alcohol. I'm gonna yak. No, no. There's alcohol. No, it's good. It is good, but it's grape juice, dude. It doesn't taste anything like beer. It's just grape juice. I guess it's good. So, what would it be like? A grape cider or something? I don't know. It has a, has a sourish to it. It's that Stephen King version. Of something. Hey, hey. I'm gonna call it Graft. What are you calling it? Well, I, I don't know what I'm that already, is. dude. I'm so learned above where you are. Uh, just pick well, a yeah. pick a name of something that you know. Grape knee high. Final answer with a little sour. I give it zero. Zero. That's Come a on. thing for this beer. Part poured is 
heart and soul into this. This is a beer review. It was How good. much does this taste like beer? How much does sour beer taste like beer? Oh, is this what we're going to do? Let's rate it as a grape juice. I've had a lot worse. I'm, I'm going with seven. Seven Tims? He literally took grape juice, like high C out of his kid's lunch, fed it to us, and you're falling for it, but I'm a learned man and I will not. This is grape right. juice. I award it no stars and may God have mercy on your soul. You all already heard my review. I do think that this beer was very unique. Um, it was cool to me that Tim sort of liked it uh, and, and Jersey seemed to kind of have a, a, a neutral opinion on it, um, but but very unique style. You seem like the type of person, Brian, who's messed around with these kind of wine beer things. Um, I seem like that kind of person. I've done um, aging with barrels that have had wine in them, but I've right. never actually added grape juice to a beer and fermented it out using yeast so the closest i've gotten is um, i've aged sour beers in riesling barrels um, and those have come out fantastic but um, it does sound like an interesting beer it's probably something i would enjoy i do enjoy beers that are aged in wine barrels um, and funkier wines too yeah th this one was um definitely a little more wine uh, forward than beers that I've had that were just aged in wine barrels. I, I believe Jordan told me that it was a, about 50% Cab Sauv juice. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So this was, this was really a 50-50 wine beer uh, uh, concoction. It was interesting. Again, uh, I, I do think that the uniqueness is what made it kind of difficult for some people <laughs> that I shared it with, maybe not to jump right on board with it. But, you know, as I was drinking it, it was, it was, it was un unenjoyable. So, uh, again, Jordan, thank you so much for letting us review that beer. If you want your beer or any other fermented beverage reviewed by Jersey and Tim, you can email me, marshall at brewlosophy.com, and we will get you all set up. All right, we're going to be back in just a minute. Have you ever thought about adding a port to your kettle but held off because you didn't feel like drilling into your gear or sending it off to have someone else do it? From the makers of the super fast counterflow chiller, the Exchillerator comes the Hangover. The easiest way to add extra ports to your kettle as well as countless other options. Mount a faucet to your keg for easy portable pouring. Set up the perfect whirlpool arm. Hold a heating element in place. All of this and so much more without permanently modifying your gear. Manufactured right here in the United States, The Hangover offers brewers too many convenient solutions to list here. So head over to Exchillerator.com today to see what The Hangover can do for you. When dumping wort-soaked grain and leftover low-gravity wort while cleaning up after a brew day, do you ever wonder what your true efficiency would be if that wort made its way to the kettle instead? Using the brew bag, a fabric filter for all mash tuns and brewing methods, allows you to capture every last drop of wort. Not only does this increase kettle efficiency, it lowers your grain bill, which saves you money. Throwing wort in the trash is like dumping a 12-pack down the drain and just doesn't make sense. Use the brew bag and leave no wort behind. I've been using these filters for a long time and recommend them to everyone. I never have to worry about a stuck sparge and clean up is fast and easy. Go grab yourself a brew bag fabric filter at brewinabag.com and be sure to use code TBP17 at checkout to get a discount on your order. Just as the Grainfather All-in-One Brewing System revolutionized all grain brewing at home, the Grainfather Conical Fermenter and Glycol Chiller take this one step further by giving home brewers state-of-the-art temperature-controlled fermentation just like commercial breweries use. With a full array of features including insulated double-walled construction, an innovative dual-valve yeast dump and sampling tap, and an integrated heating element and temperature controller, the Conical Fermenter provides a perfect professional quality fermenting environment for superior temperature control. With the ability to individually power and control the temperature of up to four Grainfather conical fermenters, each with their own fermenting schedule, the Grainfather glycol chiller is the perfect addition to ensure superior fermenting results. And for a limited time, you can save 10% on your order by going to Grainfather.com and entering coupon code NZB during checkout. Once again, enter coupon code NZB when you order the Grainfather conical fermenter or glycol chiller at grainfather.com once again that's grainfather.com
So I've been hanging out with brewers and craft beer nerds for a long time now, and while we do occasionally have our differences, one thing it seems we all share is a love of learning and trying new things, as well as saving a couple of bucks. Well, right now, Craft Beer and Brewing is helping fans of Brewlosophy learn more while saving some coin by offering 20% off the price of a subscription to their awesome magazine. Chock full of brewing insights, tips, and recipes from industry experts, Craft Beer and Brewing is seriously great. I read every issue page to page myself. To get 20% off your subscription, all you have to do is sign up at beerandbrewing.com slash brewlosophy. Yeast starters are incredibly common these days, as it's believed by many to be a key to making delicious, consistent, predictable beer. Uh, let's spend a minute uh, starting off this section talking about the purpose of yeast starters in general. So... Why do we make yeast starters? Well, generally speaking, um, the yeast that we get from the store is oftentimes fairly fresh. I guess it depends where you're buying it from. But one of the reasons that I kind of got into it is I wasn't getting the freshest yeast all the time. Um, and then I wasn't always making beers that were, you know, below the recommended 1048 original gravity that, uh, that White Labs Y yeast recommends for a single pouch of their yeast. So that, that, that's kind of how I got into it. And then, um, you know, when I started making lagers and bigger beers, I started realizing, realizing I needed more yeast cells to have a healthier fermentation. So I think for most people, the reason that they do it is to just have more yeast. It's, it's not exactly like the most fun thing in the world. <laughs> it's also not that difficult either. I mean, no, that was, it's not, that was one of the things that was, I found so appealing. I'd been making, um, you know, I'd been making beer for probably, I'd probably made, let, let's say 20 to 25 batches or so before I started making uh, yeast starters. And I, I can't really say that any of the beers that I made uh, prior to making starters had issues that c- could be like, you know, definitely identified as being a, a pitch rate issue or yeast quality issue. They had other issues like, um, you know, I added a whole bunch of uh, coconut extract to a beer one time. That was terrible. <laughs> but, 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 um, but when I started making starters, the, the, the belief behind it was that it was going to improve the consistency and the quality of the beer. Um, and at least give me an edge, uh, if the yeast isn't as up to, you know, if it's not maybe the date, maybe it's a little bit older than it should be, or, uh, you know, low cell counts, all of that stuff. So, uh, in my experience making starters, things were going pretty good. Uh, the problem that I experienced was when I went to make my first lager beer and the recommendation is almost double the cell count, uh, for when you're cool fermenting a lager. And that resulted in me picking up, uh, actually two five liter flasks and making starters that were upwards of what uh, four liters or so, and uh, the easily, easily three times as big, two, you know, two two to three times as big as what I was making for for the ales that I was brewing. Right. Yeah. I mean, I I agree with you. There's not there wasn't like a specific thing that made me think, okay, this is this my beer has suddenly gotten better. I guess the only thing that I I you know just the way my brain works, I think back and I and I think, well, I my beer has gotten better over time. And over time, you know, making starters was one of those things that I did. Yeah. As I used to pitch. So and you know, there's there's some probably some correlation without causation going on in my brain. It, you know, there's and there's a whole bunch of other things that play into that as well. Yeah. Um yeah, I agree with you. I, th- I think, yeah, the, the the two big things for me were, yeah, buying that five liter flask and realizing essentially you're making a, a gallon batch of beer. Um, and then what do you do with all of that liquid at, at that point? And then the other thing is brewing super high gravity beers. If you're yeah. brewing a super high gravity beer, now you're making this, you know, 1050, you know, 1040 starter, whatever it is that you might start out with and stepping that up. And then you've got all this liquid that, you know, might be five or 6% and you're going to add two liters of that that into your beer that you know might be anywhere from 10 up to 15 percent now you're diluting it so right um there's that aspect as well yeah and so and that that liquid uh i think the technical term for it is supernatant um it, <laughs> it, it that sounds just so fun uh but but the it, it you know in its uh in the most basic form uh that stuff that liquid is basically unhopped warm fermented oxidized beer, particularly for those who are using stir plates. Now, I, you know, I know a lot of home brewers who, who uh, almost all of whom uh, make starters at least, you know, a good portion of the time. And most of them do have, or, or they leave their flask full of uh, starter wort with the, you know, with a yeast in there on a stir plate. And I don't, I'm not sure we were kind of chatting about this, uh, this week earlier this week with the crew, Brian, but I'm not sure how much oxygen is actually being pulled into the flask. It would seem to me that the CO2 is actually getting pushed 
reached out, um, as particularly during the agitation of uh, that starter beer, uh, that it might be actually you know expressing CO2 rather than pulling uh, oxygen in there. But it seems like the risk of oxidation is is much higher in a flask that's getting spun on a stir plate than it is you know a beer that's sitting in a carboy. Uh, if you've ever tasted the supernatant. Um, uh, it's not something that I would I'd bottle up and drink for enjoyment. <laughs> no, I, I think I think you're right. Yeah, there is there is some gas exchange. Um, I think in something like a Vitality starter, where it's where it's getting going and maybe a little bit of fermentation is starting, you might not pick up as many of those oxidized characteristics. But I think where where I picked it up most is when I would make a starter, throw it on a stir plate, let it sit for a day, and then throw it in the fridge to let it crash. Right. Um, you know, at that point, you've got the oxygen kind of you know being sucked back in. It's sitting there for a day with just foil on top of it, um, and you know, and that's when it starts to taste oxidized and unhopped and not pleasant. Um, you know, the side note I would I would add to all this is I have had some of the, some of, some of the most delicious starters I've actually ever tasted have been from sour beers. Yeah, and I I pitch. Because because sour beers, you know, we tend to we tend to not really hop them very highly. I will pitch an entire liter or up to two liters of a sour starter in, um, because that to me tastes good. Well, and and in thinking of the pros and cons of decanting, um, you know, one of the one of the big cons that you'll that you'll hear about is that regardless of how long you allow the yeast and other you know microbes that you might be trying to propagate in a starter uh, to settle out that you're still going to be tossing some of that stuff, some of the goods, uh, when mm-hmm. you decant the starter and you, and you, and you, you know, toss that supernatant. And so a lot of people their you know, their argument about pitching the whole thing is that you don't, you know, you've spent all of this time trying to propagate and build up these cell counts. Uh, you, you don't want to do anything to deplete that at all. Right. And I think it depends when you make your starter too. So, um, you know, you can make a starter and still brew three or four or five days later. You know, we're not, yeah. this isn't, this isn't a vitality starter where it's, it's kind of a go time sort of thing. And I would say that's, you know, you meant we, the first thing you mentioned as well, starters are pretty easy when I said they're a pain in the ass. And the only reason I think of them as kind of a pain in the ass is because if I'm going to make a starter, it means I've got to plan my brew day multiple right. days in advance. So it's not like, it's not like you say when the, you know, the wife and kids leave for two and a half hours, let's short and shoddy this thing. You know, there, there isn't really that option unless you're using, you know, something or unless you're using multiple pouches or a pouch that contains more cells. Yeah. Well, so so in, in addition to, uh, you know, pitching or, 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 or tossing, uh, you know, some of the cells that you've worked to build up with that supernatant, there's some other uh, downsides that I've read about or heard from other people uh, about pitching the entire amount, particularly when you've got uh, a really large starter, uh, whether you're pitching that into a big beer or a cool fermented log. Uh, probably the most common one is the, the concern that whatever that starter tastes like is going to end up uh, you, the beer that you're pitching it into is going to end up taking on some of that character as well. Right. You're either getting that character into your beer or even if that starter doesn't have any character, you're diluting that beer yeah. by adding that starter. So those are the two biggest concerns. And then, well, I guess kind of the third one to put in there is be like, okay, what else is, what else might be living in here that hasn't necessarily gone through and, and eaten all the sugars available, you know, maybe some Britannomyces or maybe some lactobacillus or some other, some other contaminant that, you know, is the word that people like to use when they're making clean beers. Um, but you know, something, something else that might be in there, um, that you're not aware of. So I would say, you know, dilution, um, you know, off flavors and then contamination are probably the three biggest concerns when, when making a starter, especially a large starter, you know, for something that's smaller, like, you know, a half liter or a liter, um, you know, that's, that's not as big of a concern in my mind. Yeah. I honestly, uh, I, I mentioned it earlier, but when I first started making starters, I had a two liter flask and I don't think, you know, within maybe a quarter of a liter, you know, 250 milliliters or so of each other uh, was the was basically the range of the of the size of starters that I was making. Almost all of them were about 800 milliliters to maybe 1.2, uh, 1.2, you know, 1.2 liters. Uh, never too big for the to the for the flask. I never had issues with foaming over or anything like that. It really wasn't until I started making these bigger starters for for a cool, cool fermented lagers that I really started to wonder what in the world, particularly with lagers, right? Because you're pitching this this uh, unhopped, not very good tasting starter beer that was warm fermented and all of this stuff into what is usually kind of a delicate, you know, uh, not 
overly flavorful style. It's something that doesn't hide any flaws. Uh, and it, and it, that's really what made me say, all right, what am I doing here? Do I, do I need to decant this? Uh, and if I do, how do I account for the lost cells that I'm pitching, uh, you know, during the, um, or, or, you know, when I'm going to, to ferment? Right. And maybe a solution to that is, is kind of one thing that you've brought up a, a while ago is, is overbuilding starters. So if you're, if you're planning on having some loss because you are decanting, maybe a solution to that is to overbuild your starter so you account for that loss. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure that it wouldn't be, I mean, honestly, it's kind of a, a, an unexact science anyways, the whole, you know, right. st- starter calculator and whatnot. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I, it's not that hard to overbuild. I know there's some concerns out there about over pitching potentially, and, you know, as, as well as under pitching and whatnot. But, uh, it seems to me that those are the most talked about potential downsides to, uh, not decanting your larger starters. Uh, but some of the pros, I think the easiest pro or the, or the biggest pro is just that it's so easy to pitch that whole amount into the beer first off, but secondly, by doing so, not only are you not get, getting rid of those cells, but I think the, a typical process that people who can't do is they cold crash. So you're kind of putting, you're starting the process of putting those yeast to sleep. So maybe they're not as uh, vibrant and ready to go when when you're pitching. If you're pitching uh, the full starter, you can take it right off of your right off of your stir plate and, and toss it in, even at high croissant, and really start to you know get get fermentation activity right away. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of shifting into, you know, just a little discussion more about the vitality starter. Right. And that's something that, that I've done more recently than any other type of starter, because what I, what I will do is I'll brew the batch of beer and then I will pull off some of the beer after it's cooled down, mix the yeast in, let it sit for four hours, kind of get it energized and then pitch it in, you know, same way, same way you make sourdough bread, you know, you kind of warm up that sourdough first before pitching it into the entire um, flour and water combination. Right, right. And, th- and this, you know, uh, that we, we're not going to f- focus too much on vitality starters. That's for another show. But just to distinguish them between uh, what I call normal starters or, or viability starters, um, vitality starters are almost always made with, uh, according to Colin Kaminsky, his recommendation was uh, 500 milliliters of wort. You don't need any more than that. You basically just want to pro- provide just enough uh, carbohydrates to get those yeasts really going so that when it hits your wort, but if you're, if you're trying to propagate cells, if you're trying to build up the cell count, which vitality starters don't necessarily do, uh, that's where you're going to use, you know, the typical uh, viability starter method, which, you know, it, that, in my experience, it's, we're talking, I, I, I make starters maybe two days before I plan on brewing. Yeah. Why don't, we, why don't we go through and why don't you just, or we can each share the method for how we make starters for people out there. Cause there might not be, there might be people out, people out there that are reading um, some of the packaging saying, Oh, I just need one smack pack for up to 1055 or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good idea. And here's the deal. Also, it, it doesn't matter what yeast company you're going with. Every single one of them will encourage you to make starters. I've even, yeah, we use Imperial almost exclusively nowadays. Uh, you know, they're known for packing 200 billion cells into their, into their pouches and whatnot. Even they will still say you're you're you know you're reducing the risk of of issues if you just propagate your yeast in a starter. Just do the right thing. It's a it's a good thing. So for those who may not be doing that, who are considering doing that, you you don't have to go out and buy a whole bunch of stuff. Um, you can use uh, we've all got, I think we all use you know nerdy looking science flasks, but you you can <laughs> use a growler, you can use a Nalgene bottle, anything that you can close off so that nothing gets into it. Uh, it, it needs to be able to vent as well. Um, that that's really all you need. I. I use, uh, you know, what is it? Uh, uh, the ratio of dry malt extract to size. I think I use uh, ten grams per milliliter or something like that. Or uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not on. I'm I'm more on uh, the other units. I think it's I think it's one o- one ounce of dry malt extract and one liter of water is ten ten. Yeah, two o- two ounces is ten twenty. So I use I tend to use four ounces in per liter. Yep, and that's about what I'm using as well. I'll use about 200 grams of dry malt extract for a two liter, uh, for a two liter um, uh, starter. So, uh, and then you just what I my my process is I'll I'll mix that with some hot water right out of the tap just to get it nice and dissolved uh, with the exact amount that you need. And that's when I'll toss in my stir bar if you're going to throw it on a stir plate. Again, not a totally necessary step. Um, and then I'll throw it on my stove and let it uh, boil for 10 minutes and make sure I add some ferment. Uh, what is that? Firm cap S so that I don't get a yeah. volcanic eruption. It will happen. I promise you it will happen. Uh, but I boil right in the flask. A lot of people will recommend not doing that. I've yet to have an issue doing 
doing that with with what four different flasks that I've used. Um, and then from there, I'll take it and I'll set it in an ice bath. I'll cover the the opening of the flask with some foil, uh, let it chill down to about seventy degrees Fahrenheit. Pitch my yeast, toss it on a stir plate, and uh, off to the races. Yeah, mine's my method's pretty much the same, except some for some reason I fear glass over an open flame. So I usually um, just put a pan of water on, heat it up, throw in my throw my extract stirred up a little little yeast nutrient occasionally um and then yeah pitch the cool it down pitch the yeast and go yeah yeah it's a it's not a bad way to uh, make sure that you're pitching the right amount of cells and, and again you know a lot of people will talk about uh not needing starters with dry yeast the main thing about that is that uh, dry yeast comes with a, a lot of cells you know packaged already uh, but you can absolutely i know people who do it regularly make starters just to make sure you you're propagating enough yeast whether it's for a lager or for a big beer um, you can make a starter with dry yeast not an issue at all yeah i think I, th- I think one of the big things with uh making starters that we do it is because it's a lot cheaper than it is to buy you know multiple packages of yeast i mean if you if you have the money and you want to go buy four or five packages of yeast and dump them in you're getting you're getting a very similar effect yeah yeah um you know and for dry yeast because it tends to be a lot cheaper um i i don't ever make starters for dry yeast i just buy two packages of it yeah yeah no that's i so, very rarely use dry yeast anymore yeah i mean days, i don't so. use it anymore yeah. yeah well and the other thing is i i gotta be honest i i have not been making um standard starters like this v- much lately at all i can no. see why people would and the reasons my reasons are and we keep referring to like bigger beers and cool fermented lagers it's because i don't really make either of those very often so the the yeast that we are getting to to, to brew the beers that we brew typically work perfectly fine for you know the 1048 to 1055 og uh, standard ale or or at least the beers fermented at ale ale fermentation temperatures um like a lot of the lagers that i've made lately um so that you know that's my thing but but definitely not a bad thing another another option for is for folks who overbuild starters so that they can harvest yeast uh these are definitely things that you have to take into consideration as well as far as yeast harvesting goes my recommendation is do not decant until after you harvest the amount of uh well, it would be start. It would be your full starter volume. Uh, you know, and I take off about a pint um, for when I'm harvesting yeast, and then let that settle out, and then I leave that yeast under the starter beer and just leave it alone until I'm ready to propagate another starter in the future. And then you can go ahead and cold crash the if you're if you're into uh, you know decanting, you can go ahead and cold crash the the other starter and decant off of that. But um, yeah, as far as as uh, you know, cons to decanting go, there really aren't that many. I guess by taking the the foil off and pouring it out, you are kind of increasing the risk of potential contamination. Um, if you pour off too much of the supernatant, it can make resuspending that yeast really difficult. And so you you know you you pour you go to pitch it and you end up leaving some yeast behind in the flask. Yeah, quick solution: pour a little bit of beer back in. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Uh, yeah. The the other things that I've heard about uh, you know uh, you know about pitching the full volume of your starter and this is kind of a pro to you know people saying don't you don't have to decant is that there's this claim out there that that any off flavors that are produced during the starter making process while that starter beer is being fermented get in some way remetabolized and taken care of during uh, beer fermentation i'm not an expert on that stuff but i guess it sort of makes sense to me a little bit no, this is probably where I'd text Malcolm and say like, hey, have you heard of this? <laughs> but to be <laughs> yeah. honest, I, I don't know. I, I've, I've read similar things and people have had similar claims anecdotally, but um, I haven't seen any specific literature, nor have I really searched that hard. But yeah. um, it's not something that I that really comes up as much in conversation. I mean, most people I know, they make starters and they just, they, they decant and they dump. Yep, that's that's about uh, what, I'm, what I've seen as well. And uh, I, I was interested to put it to the test, so I designed a fun little experiment uh, that we're going to talk about about when we return from this short break. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately, I settled on the super-efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. 
With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of work from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Hi, I'm Stephen Leach, creator of Brow Supply Brewing Systems, here to tell you about our latest Unibrow Brewing System. Modeled after the brew in a bag method, the Unibrow uses the same kettle for both mashing and boiling, replacing the fabric bag with a stainless basket that can hold up to 20 pounds of grain. A heating element is run by an electric controller that allows for the maintenance of specific mash temperatures and makes mashing easier than ever. Each Unibrow is shipped with a counterflow chiller and the parts required to brew a batch of beer. We're really proud of the Unibrow, and we know you'll love it as much as we do. Go check it out at BrowSupply.com and sign up for our email list to receive special deals in your inbox. Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supplies, the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code. Code BrewPod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. When I first started making yeast starters, I was primarily brewing ales that ranged from about 1050 OG to about 1060 OG. So my starters were almost never bigger than, I, I would say like a max of about 1.2 liters or 1200 milliliters. Uh, it wasn't until I began cold fermenting lagers that I started making much bigger. And it, these starters were huge, four liters, four and a half liters sometimes, uh, which caused me to question whether or not adding uh, that liquid, also known as supernatant, <laughs> would affect the quality of my beer. <laughs> Um, I'd adopted a simple heuristic, this rule of thumb, where I would decant any starter that was over 5% the volume of the beer, which, as it turns out, is uh, about one liter for five-gallon batches. So any starter that I would make that was over about one liter, if it was 1,200 milliliters or something, I would just pitch the whole thing. Uh, but that would be kind of the trigger for me to consider decanting that supernatant off uh, because I was afraid of how it might impact the flavor of my beer. Well, to see if it really even mattered, I designed this very simple experiment. Um, so my first order of business was figuring out how to approach this variable in the cleanest and most controlled way possible. And what we ultimately decided to do is make a single large starter. I believe it was three and a half liters. Uh, propagate the yeast, then evenly split that starter, cold crash both of the starters, then decant the supernatant from one of them back into the other one. <laughs> so what we were trying to do was get as much. And now, again, one of the arguments here, and it's, it makes total sense, is that, well, the one that gets the supernatant decanted back into it probably has more cells than the decanted starter because there are going to be some still suspended in that liquid. Well, we had to we had to make, you know, cut some corners, I guess, and come to something, and this seemed like the best approach. Uh, seemed It seemed the most effective way, at least, to ensure similar pitch rates while avoiding the impact of other extraneous variables. So, uh, the yeast that we went with for this one was a dry, uh, dry yeast, Saflogger W3470, but it was just a single packet for this 10-gallon batch. Uh, I made a 10-gallon batch of my Munich Hellas recipe. Just to I really wanted to emphasize any differences between these beers, and this recipe gets like a single hop addition, really, really light uh, grist. It's 87% Pilsner malt, 12% light M Munich, and 1% melanoidin malt. Nothing to hide behind in this beer. Uh, I mashed it at 150 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 66 degrees Celsius for 60 minutes, then boiled for an hour with a single dose of noble hops for bittering. I believe this one was a Hollertau middle fru. Um, and then I chilled, chilled the wort. Uh, at that point, I took a hydrometer measurement that showed the beers were at 10 or the worts were at 1047 OG. Again, nice low OG, you know, really simple grain bill. There's nothing to hide behind in this beer. So when you made your starters, would you, did you, what did you use to make the stars? Were you using dry malt extract? Yeah. Uh, so every time I make uh, a, a standard viability starter, I use Pilsner malt extract, uh, the lightest 
the little, and it, yeah. I use the the dry malt extract. I never use uh, for anything really. Right. I never use the liquid malt extract. Ugh, what a mess! And what do you what what would you say your if you remember what your gravity was on your starter? Yeah, uh, I always aim for ten forty OG for my starters. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I they, and you know I don't, I don't measure them, but using right. that calculation we talked about earlier that ten, I have before, and it always ranges between ten thirty nine ten forty one ish or so. Um, so that's what those were. Uh, again, identical amounts of wort were then racked uh, to separate. Fermenters, they'd been sanitized, of course. Uh, and then those were placed next to each other in my fermentation chamber to finish chilling to my desired fermentation temperature of 66 degrees Fahrenheit. I know for a Munich hell, oh, it's no. blasphemous, but it uh. is what it is. That's 19C for all you international folks out there. Um, <laughs> if anyone who has used 3470, we've got shows on this and, and or any of the uh, the Weinstefan, you know variants that's global from Imperial Yeast or WLP 830 from White Labs. Uh, that stuff is incredibly robust and produces an, a very, very clean fermentation character when fermented at ale temperatures. Uh, but don't don't take my word for it. Anyways, uh, this, this took a few hours. Uh, it took a few hours for these worts to finish chilling back down to that 66 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so that's when I prepared the starters by, you know, they, they had been they had been uh, cold crashing that whole day. Um, so right when they were ready, those worts were ready to be pitched I, is when I did the decanting and, and adding that supernate into the other flask and whatnot. Uh, in the end, there was a difference in wor- in starter volume of 2.6 liters. So one of the worts was pitched with an entire full three liter starter, while the other one was hit with what looked to be about 400 milliliters of yeast slurry in the bottom. So, that, so that's about 15 percent of the beer. It it well, yeah ish. exactly yeah 15 ish yeah. percent. So you know triple what I would normally. Say, right. is, say is okay. Um, I, I did taste this yeast starter. Uh, it did not taste good at all. And so, it, you know, again, it's I'm pitching it into a Munich Hellas. Uh, I, what would you expect, it, you know, in doing that? Yeah, I would think... I would think after eight hours, you'd probably still have a bunch of yeast and suspension would be my guess. Um, I don't... I, mine generally don't drop out super fast. Uh, so I would think you'd be tasting yeast, which in my mind doesn't really taste that good. It tastes like poorly made New England IPA. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> got to bring it up every episode, man. You got to bring it up. And you're, the, and you're the one who likes that style. Uh, I do like that style, but we're not going to go there right now. So <laughs> my, my thing, my concern with this one was given how low the OG was, there's no denying the fact that uh, there was an element of dilution at play uh, in the beer that received the three liter starter compared to the one that received the 400 milliliter starter. Uh, after the, after the beers were pitched, you look at the, you could look in the carboys and the, and, you know, one of them definitely had more volume than the other one. So, mm-hmm. it, you know, to me, I'm going, all right, that right off the bat, you've got this dilute slightly more diluted, uh, version versus one that's not at all. You basically receive just yeast. So, uh, that kind of did skew my kind of expectations a little bit. I wasn't entirely convinced that I wouldn't be able to taste uh, a difference. Um, some interesting objective observations, uh, during fermentation. Well, so immediately after pitching, it was only like 10 hours after pitching or so, uh, both batches were fermenting like crazy. The, the air locks were bubbling rapidly. There was no, by what I could see, there was no delay in start time in either of the batches of beer uh, once they were pitched. So I kind of expected the decanted starter beer to maybe start, uh, you know, four or five hours after the other one. But but in my observation, they started around the same exact time and fermented, you know, with equal amount of vigor. Yeah. I mean, why, why would you expect it to be four to five hours different? The main thing is because of what, what you were talking about is that that supernatant did have a, right. uh, you know, it had, unarguably yeah. had yeast cells in it. And so I figured that maybe that uh, slight over pitch, or at least the fact that it received a little bit more yeast than the decanted starter one, uh, I just thought mm-hmm. maybe that would have, a, have an impact. But it, apparently it didn't in terms of, of fermentation activity. Uh, the beers eventually, you know, I, I fermented these like an ale. So within two weeks they were done, which was awesome. Uh, the, the FG of the full starter batch ended up at 10 Oh eight. Uh, at, while the decanted starter was at 10 Oh nine, you know, gasp. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, my goodness. That to me doesn't seem like really a big deal. Uh, but it could be that, that, you know, that additional yeast that was, per, you know, presumably in the full starter, uh, maybe that worked a little bit harder. I don't know. 
So the beers uh, were kegged up and treated identically. They were both burst carbonated, and I allowed them to condition for a little while. Uh, I did hit them both with gelatin. And I don't know if these days I would do that, but I, I, you know, I still don't think that it had that big of an impact. Uh, the beers looked, in my opinion, identical next to each other. When, once they were carbonated and ready to serve, they looked exactly the same. Neither was more clear or more hazy than the other. So uh, you know, at this point, I'm looking at these things going, all right, you got 1008 and clear, 1009 and clear. Are they going to taste different? That really was you know, the big question at this point. So uh, personally, when I did my own series of triangle tests, I could not tell these beers apart at all. They, they smelled, tasted, and felt in, in my mouth exactly the same. There was no way I would have been able to tell if you served me one from one keg and then you know a, a pint from the other keg. So uh, yeah, they were identical to me. I ended up serving these beers to, to 20 participants, out of which 11 would have had to identify the odd beer out in, in order for us to say that it was significant. And in the end, only eight people. So a whopping 40% of the participant pool uh, identified the unique sample, which is not significant. That's you know, just a, a, a hair more than chance, what you'd expect from chance alone. Um, so pretty surprising that you, know, you got this beer that received three liters of uh, you know, warm, fermented, presumably oxidized, non-hopped beer. Uh, you know, that that beer fermented with that tasted, for all intents and purposes, identical to the one that was pitched with basically just 400 milliliters of, of, of yeast slurry. Yeah, so my thoughts on that would be your starter, I mean, other than the fact that it's got the oxidized element, which I don't know, I mean, I didn't taste it. So I'm, again, this is all just speculation. Yeah. Um, you know, if you, it didn't taste good. So in my mind, that usually, usually a yeasty something doesn't really taste too awesome to me once, <laughs> unless it's been fermented or baked. Um, and so that's where I'm, you know, I mean, I, I guess the first question is, did it taste oxidized to you? Do you remember at all? Neither of the beers tasted or looked no, oxidized Not the beers, the starter. The starter. The starter. I, I don't, you know, the thing is, um, my, my mental framework for what oxidized yeah. tastes like is really uh, kind of attached to oxidized full beer. So, right. you know, hops and, and, and all, other character malts and whatnot. To me, it just tasted tart. I, you know, not tart like uh, acidic, but you, you, you ever drink a beer that's not quite done fermenting and you get right. that yeasty kind of sharpness? That's, that's all it yeah. tasted like, really bland. So yeah, I, so my guess, my guess would be, I mean, your starter, your, your gravity of your starter wasn't too much different than the gravity of the beer. So, you know, we don't really have a huge difference and we, you know, we've done a lot of experiments or not a lot, but several experiments in the past, um, you know, where tasters haven't even been able to distinguish a, a you know, a 10 points apart yeah. on, on certain beers. So, I mean, the gravity is fairly similar. It is a fairly low hopped beer. Um, you know, it's, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to jump on the other side of the fence and say, it's not terribly surprising to me that they couldn't tell the beers apart simply because the, 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 the dilution, um, you know, what you're, the supernatant you're, dil, you're diluting with isn't other than the hopping and the boiling and whatnot, isn't terribly different than the beer. I mean, the, the, the base starter is a very similar brew to the base yeah. beer. And so I, I wonder a couple things I wonder is where we, if we would see that dilution more and like, you know, a, a, a highly hopped West coast IPA or, yeah. or a large barley wine, um, something like that. So, um, you know, whether I think that oxidative flavor is something that probably dilutes out and I'm, I'm just total speculation, but I I'm guessing it dilutes out and we probably can't pick up on it once when you dilute it that much. Yeah. Um, you know, or, or especially into more characterful beers, but I think the I think the actual dilution of the beer gravity or the dilution of the the bitterness of the beer might be something that we'd see more in in a higher IBU beer or a higher gravity beer. Yeah, one of the um, I, I forget who it was with, but I got into a conversation with somebody about um, the fact that the sort of like you what you were alluding to, Munich Hellas and uh, starter beer aren't that different, right? So it's almost like tossing in maybe a poorly made version, a small amount of a poorly made version of the same beer, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it kind of fixes any ills. And, you know, potentially that's what it is. I mean, maybe I, I, li I like the idea of, of uh, you know, redoing this experiment on a, a beer that is more highly flavored. Because in my, my mind, the, my original kind of implication from this or the thing that I gleaned from it was, man, if it didn't screw up the flavor of a Munich Hellas, the, the easiest beer to have flaws in, uh, why in the world would I presume that it, that it would potentially have an impact on an even more characterful beer? 
But it right. sort of and makes th- sense that it might, you know, now that we talk about it. So yeah. it makes sense. But, that I, it might. but I think I think the point to make is, is that or not the point, but I think the, the takeaway for me is I think you're right. It, it is unlikely to have an impact in terms of the off flavors or whatever nasty things other than the yeast that you're tasting in the starter. Yeah. But the dilution itself would have an impact. Right. Right. You know what I mean? Well, so, yeah. And you, and you take something like a double IPA, right? Or that, right. that is, that is uh, let's just say 70 IBU. Uh, when you're adding 5% of a completely unhopped starter beer, to, to mm-hmm. that, uh, the the impact on p- the potential impact on that perceptible bitterness uh, seems right. like it would be greater than in a beer that's not known for being very bitter in the first place. That's not something you're going to notice about it. So I, I think it's a good point. We definitely need right. to uh, revisit this one. But it's it's cool that the idea that that three liter starter that might have been you know oxidized or whatever tasting you know anything that you tasted that was gross that wasn't yeast that that dilutes out on a music hellas is big i think yeah yeah no i think that's the that's the that's my takeaway is that okay yeah there, there's that so if we do it in a larger beer or an ipa the 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 off flavor dilution is probably going to be even more easily hidden whereas the dilution would be something that we'd have to think about more yeah no awesome points uh before we get to some reader comments i you know w- i mentioned this whole five percent uh of the volume of the beer rule of thumb i have to admit th- these results did kind of cause me to rethink that and when I do make viability starters now, um, you know, usually they're not four liters. Uh, they're, they're still kind of in the two to three liter range, even for when I am doing the very uh, rare cold fermented, uh, uh, you know, lager or whatever. Um, you know, I, I just pitched the whole thing. And, and, and I have to admit, it was based on my experience with these beers as well as the uh, results from the blind tasters. So interesting stuff. Uh, we do have some reader comments as always. Uh, first one comes from CJ. He says, is it possible that the lower finishing gravity on the non-decanted starter beer was because the starter wort actually diluted the beer? Even if there is no flavor difference, thinning out the beer with weaker starter wort might be reason enough to decant. Yeah, I mean, I think that's completely possible. You are adding a lower gravity, um, lower gravity product in, so there is there is a small amount of dilution. I guess you'd have to just run the numbers and see whether that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, it's so small. Yeah, I agree. And, well, and and CJ, your guess is as good as ours. My my, you know, kind of hunch was that maybe there was a little bit more yeast. But now that I think about it, uh, maybe that tiny little, you know, one specific gravity point difference was because I tossed in, you know, a lower OG. I have to. I have to imagine that the uh, you know, 1040 OG starter, when it gets fermented out, it's it's getting pretty low. It's probably down 1002, 1003 is my guess. I've never measured it. So yeah, I could see how adding three liters of that into uh, you know five gallon batch of of uh, 1048 beer might might have be what accounted for the lower finishing gravity. Makes sense to me. Uh, yeah, I also wonder. Kind of, it would have been hindsight 2020 interesting to see how the uh, original gravity of the beer changed i know i, uh, I wish i would when, have taken a measurement yeah. of that yeah all right dan's got some feedback um from the article and he says i'd like to see this experiment without the full starter being chilled at all he said i pitch mine right off the stir plate and get such fast vigorous fermentations i have stuck with it never notice any off flavors either yeah uh i think that method is a is a solid method for ensuring very quick starts to fermentation now again this differs from what we refer to as the vitality starter which is you know four hours on the stir plate and then pitch it immediately uh, which also results in, in in at least in my experience some very quick starts to fermentation um i i think ideally um if you're not harvesting yeast for reuse uh, you know, if you're not doing anything like that, what the, the, for viability, what you want to do is propagate that yeast for about 24 to 36 hours and then take it right off the stir plate and pitch it. If you can, uh, that's what I've heard at least. And in my experience doing that, I have this I've, same thing as Dan, uh, you know, very quick starts to fermentation. It doesn't usually take very long for fermentation to, to finish up. Uh, so, uh, I, I don't think that it would have been as easy to design an experiment if we were doing that, unless we had two separate starters, which, you know, we could do that. Um, it it just, we'd just have to, you know, account for if there are any differences. I, I do think that there's more at play in that type of an experimental design. Yeah. Agreed. Right on. Uh, we got another comment from Tim Hayes. He says, I'm not surprised that the tasting panel didn't find a significant difference while the beer is young. Uh, I'd be interested to see the tasting repeated after another four to six weeks. Would pitching a highly oxidized starter wort give premature oxidation off flavors before 
the decanted beer here. I think it was about three to four weeks in the keg at the time of data collection already. So it, was, you know, it had lagered, if you will, for about a month. And I'm pretty sure any oxidation in the starter would be um, you know, re-uptook uh, during the fermentation process of the beer. Also, a lot of what I've been reading lately has been that uh, you know, even on stir plates, that that's not sucking oxygen into the flask. So I, you know, yeah, it's being agitated. I'm sure there's more oxygen uh, than there is in, in, a, in a whole carboy of beer. But I, I don't think that, that it, the oxygen in there is actually going to have the impact that we're all kind of assuming that it would uh, say if it was a beer being agitated. I don't know. No, I think a lot of people that are recommending, um, you know, if quote, quote unquote, best methods for making a starter are saying that in addition to having your starter on a stir plate, you want to be giving it um, some kind of ox- some kind of supply of oxygen, whether that's a pump or hitting it with a little bit of oxygen every now and then. Right. Um, I believe, I don't know whether I was reading it in a yeast book or just online that uh, Australian home brewers, they put their, make their starters in a two liter plastic bottle so that they can squeeze the bottle to squeeze out, um, you know, any carbon dioxide and then, you know, suck in more air and that they get a bigger air exchange that way i i would be i don't know it'd be slightly concerning depending on where you're doing it and yeah. what sorts of other <laughs> things you might be bringing back in but his you know when he says a highly oxidized starter you know we kind of touched on that earlier that even if it was a highly oxidized starter and you've got these other compounds that are in that are in this starter that it seems that they are diluted as far as premature oxidation. You hit the nail on the head, you know, yeast need oxygen to be able to grow and bud and, um, get, and have their numbers grow. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, that's a good thing. And, you know, you would, you would want that starter to be as, have as much oxygen in it as possible. Right. Well, yeah. And when, one of the thoughts that I've got is you got to remember you're pitching your starter into wort that you, uh, a lot of people, I, I, I don't, but a lot of people, you know, hit with pure oxygen. Uh, and so right. by adding even let's, let's just say that this starter beer is completely oxidized. Um, may, now maybe that the flavors of the oxidized beer, if this is what Tim is asking about, uh, that the, that those flavors would carry over. That was my big concern is that whatever bad flavor that, that, you know, uh, starter beer tastes like that, that is, I'm going to get hints of that in my finished beer. It didn't seem to be the case in the experiment that we did. Um, but, but regardless, if there's a, a ton of oxygen in that and you're pitching it into wort, uh, that you kind of want to have oxygen into anyways, I, I can't see how that piece of it would necessarily lead to, uh, negative outcome. But it, you know, again, like I said, it's something that I def, I, you know, I was concerned about before this experiment. Um, I, I just didn't seem to experience it as being as bad as I thought, you know? All right. Um, Reddit user Will Fisher says, Hey, fascinating result. I too have been decanting large starters. So this result surprised me. One of my reasons for decanting is that the extra volume of wort in the non-decanted version would mean amongst other things, lower IBU and SRM, which we kind of just touched on. Yeah. If you had 20 IBU in the recipe, then surely your non-decanted version might be somewhere around um, 17 IBU based on some calculations he did. He says, I guess that also must mean that there'd be a 2.3 IBU difference there, which might necessarily be perceptible to people, not surprising to him. He says one of the things he finds interesting is how the experiment series has taken as a whole is a great study into the perception level of humans. <laughs> yeah, we could talk, we could sit and talk about how wonky our, our you know, perception abilities are, uh, but that, that's got to be another show. Uh, I, yeah, we did touch on this. By adding in, you know, three plus liters of starter wort that's non-hopped, you are, I mean, th- th- you're going to affect the the IBU level or the, or the percept or, well, I don't know if I should say perceptible, but the bitterness level, total bitterness level. Now, whether that's perceptible or not, you know, that's up in the air. Uh, his calculations, again, he did give this, this really neat calculation. That's kind of difficult to, to, you know, talk about here. Uh, but he determined that, you know, if you're at 20 IBU and you add, you know, a certain amount of starter work, you're back down to 17 or whatever. Uh, you know, I've heard that in terms of bitterness, that about a five IBU difference is usually where people start to notice the difference, I I don't know if I'm that good or not, but um, you know, if in a five gallon batch, if you're only going to hit, you're going to take a, a 2.3 IBU hit. Again, I don't know if that's a strong enough argument. You can easily just add three more pellets of you know hot pellets during the boil uh, to fix that. But um, but yeah, it makes a good point. Yeah, I mean for and for if for for beers like. Your, your Hellas recipe and whatnot, where you've got this very small IBU difference, you know, you could just take that starter and you could just hop it a little bit since you're boiling it. Um, you know, that, that's an, that's an easy solution. And for, for beers like, um, 
for IPAs where there's a concern, you know, we're talking right now, we're talking about pitching a three liter starter into a cold fermented lager or sorry, you fermented this warm, but a, a, a lager beer. Um, generally for, for most IPAs they're there, unless you're making an Indian pale lager, um, you're using an ale yeast. So, yeah, yeah. um, you know, your starter is going to be one, one liter or less. And if you are concerned about it, you know, you could bump up your recipe by an, an IBU or two. Um, but I, I, like you said, you know, I think, I believe, I believe you're right. The threshold is about five IBU. So, you know, pitching a liter is not really an issue. And for a lager, if you've got, you know, a large starter going in, you could just, you could just hop that starter ever so slightly. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. Completely agree. Uh, all right. Final comment comes from our friend testing April over on Reddit. Uh, he says, I assume you make your starters out of pills DME and given the grain bill is mostly pills. This result probably shouldn't be as surprising as you. And I find it to be, I wonder if there might be a perception difference in a darker or hoppier beer where the net flavor difference between the starter wort and the beer wort is greater. If you taste these side by side, uh, do you have a preference? Do you feel there is a difference between the beers outside of a triangle test? So uh, I'll answer those questions in a minute, but I think he is hitting on exactly what we were just talking about. And I like the way he puts it, uh, that the net flavor difference is just greater between, say, a Russian Imperial Stout and a, you know, a Pilsner DME starter beer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for those of you at home that want to kind of do something fun and see, huh, I wonder if there is a difference is go buy, go out and buy a Russian Imperial Stout. And, you know, since you probably already got a case of the founder's solid gold in your fridge, take that Russian <laughs> Imperial Stout, dilute it by, you know, 10%, 20%, 30% and have somebody in your house or go find somebody outside your house, mix up a triangle <laughs> test for you and see if you can tell a difference. Yeah. That, that'd be a super easy way to, to figure out the whole dilution thing. Or if you want to be really dramatic, dilute it with water and see, you know, that if you can't tell with water at 15%, I'm, I'm guessing it might be kind of hard to do with, uh, with starter work. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me think of all of the stories you hear about people, you know, racking beer into a keg that has half a gallon of uh, star sand solution in there oh, and then drinking yeah. it and not being able, <laughs> it sounds terrible, but you hear these stories and people aren't able to, you know, that it turned out great. Turned out fine. Yeah. Great um, head retention. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay. To answer uh, Dan's questions or testing April, uh, his questions, he says, if you taste these side by side, uh, do you have a preference? This was a couple years ago. I did not have a preference side by side. And no, uh, I did not think that I could taste the difference between these beers, even in unblind side by side tastings. It is pretty common for us to, to for our biases to kind of leak in sometimes and for us to kind of think that that in these side by sides, uh, we're picking up a difference or whatever it might be. But then as soon as we put them in a triangle, you know, we we are unable to to really uh, distinguish the the different beer, out, you know, odd beer out. So uh, that was not the case in these one in, in this test in particular uh, from the moment I was serving myself these beers from the kegs they tasted absolutely identical and I'll admit like you know it did sort of surprise me and uh, you know again my take now is it, I'm not gonna toss any of the yeast that I've worked so hard to propagate so I pitch my starter's full. Brian, what are you doing? I would say for a one liter starter I am just pitching the entire thing. Um, I don't I don't make many starters, uh, viability, st or I don't make many viability starters these days. Most of the starters I'm doing are vitality ones. Cause I like to take a little while, let the, you know, do a little whirlpool, let the, let everything kind of settle down, um, go have dinner and then I'll come back and I'll pitch and, yeah. and put everything back. So I'm doing more viability starter just to kind of get that yeast energized. Um, you know, as we've, as we always mention in, in a lot of our, our um, articles and whatnot. Imperial's pitch is so big in the first place, and we're, we're most all of us are using Imperial all the time now. So there really isn't a huge need to make a starter unless you're making a big beer. For a big beer, um, I do try to I do try to um, do a multiple step starter, and I try to have that second or third step be a higher gravity. Um, just because in my mind, I'm thinking I'm not diluting it quite as much. Hmm. Yeah. Well, and the other thing with vitality starters, what, what I've seen some people do, in fact, I've, I've seen this a few times just in the last few weeks, is um, they'll take sort of, it's sort of like a hybrid starter method where uh, they'll, you know, they'll take their wort, they put it in the fermenter, toss it in the chamber, let it sit for, you know, 24 hours. And so rather than doing the four hour vitality starter, they'll propagate their yeast, but using the same exact wort 
uh, that that their beer is made from. Right. So exactly. That's what, that's what I'm using. Is I'm using the same wort that the beer is made from. Right. Right. And, and yeah. in that, you know, you look at that and going, all right, you can make it as big as you want. Really, you've basically eliminated, uh, you know, uh, most of the concern that people express about pitching big starters. The only thing, I guess, would be the the potential oxidation and the warm fermentation. Most people ferment their starters. I think, you know on the kitchen counter or whatever, 68 to 74 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is 19 to 22 degrees C, I guess. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, I think that's a good approach. Uh, I like uh, with you, you know, I'm still making vitality starters occasionally, but I still kind of pitch direct anyways. That is where we're at. And that is all the time that we have got for this show. Is there anything else that you have to share on decanting yeast starters, Brian? You know, Marshall, I can't think of anything else we can <laughs> oh, say right now. <laughs> right. Well, don't forget to head over to brewlosophy.com to read about the experiment discussed in this episode, as well as everything else we're up to. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors, as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it soothes my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man no more.